You do you really? Okay. Um, yeah, different. He said he's, he bops around 1400 RPM. The point is, variable speed buffer. I kind of float, I kind of fluctuate, but I start off typically about a thousand, and then I read the panel and I see. But this is a DeWalt buffer. We're not buffing at this speed. It's not happened. If this hits me in the crotch, this demonstration is over. So. Have, have you ever buffed out a 1950 Ford Tudor hardtop? Cadillac conversion van. It's like cruise control. That's 600 grit. I don't have to worry about the trigger. Now I can look at my panel. I'm looking at the reflection. I'm, I'm not worried about this. I took this out of the equation. His question was, why don't I just ride the trigger, get a lower RPM when I want to? I said it's cruise control. It saves me from having to think about that. I'm thinking about enough. I'm thinking about these edges. I'm thinking about, you know, the customer that I have to explain that I rolled the paint edge off of that hood. I'm thinking about what my next step is. I'm probably thinking about a sandwich for dinner. But this eliminates one layer of me having to think and allows me to read the panel. When you're hammering a nail, do you look at the nail or do you look at the hammer? You look at the nail. If you look at the hammer, buddy, <laughs> your thumb is going to be fat and purple. So you and it's the same thing with painting. It's the same thing with buffing. You're looking at your subject and you're reading the surface while the rest of the action is happening. You got to trust your compounds, you got to trust your machinery, and you got but mostly you have to trust your eyes. You're reading the panel just the same as you're watching the nail and your your just muscle memory is guiding your hammer. So, we're on wool. We're we're uh, 600 RPM, I'm going to use Mike's shirt as an apron because my Eastwood Summer Classic shirt is awesome. No, no, I've got shirts that are ruined from that. Um, yeah, you can throw them in the laundry, but, but you know, why not just, uh, just protect yourself? Are we getting audio? Okay. to our technically dazzling show. Joe, can you hear this? Hi, Joe. That's Joe up there in the top in the wings. Coincidentally, it's probably about 90 degrees in here. It's about 102 up there. Give it up for Joe. <laughs> he's, he's working his butt off. The, uh, the Eastwood video team, and I'm going to take a second to talk about hands-on cars. The Eastwood video team, we have ridiculous amount of fun. We should, and, and Brian's in here, we shouldn't be getting paid for doing it, but we are. But hands-on cars is a web show. Um, I don't know how many of you guys have seen uh, Roadkill from Hot Rod Magazine. We looked at Roadkill and said, man, what can we do? What can we do where we can still do some how-to, some DIY stuff, and go out into the industry and have some fun? Uh, you know, I've spent the last 13 years of my life doing automotive television shows on cable, and I love it. I love the format. I love the, uh, the expression and the, the ability to, to take techniques and pass them on when we can do that. Plus, you know, driving 1,100 horsepower pickup trucks, not such a bad gig. So I like TV, but the Internet, oh, my God, the Internet relieves so much of the rules of television, and we're having a lot of fun. So I urge you, uh, Hands on Cars, it's a great new show. We just uploaded our second episode. We've got a bunch more coming this year. We just went up to the ASE mu Museum in Hershey and made fun of all kinds of stuff. And at, at the same time as respecting the craftsmanship and the survivors and, and uh, uh, American Muscle, uh, they're good friends of ours. And they hand, I don't know why, they handed me the keys to a prepped 2014 Coyote-powered Mustang. And, uh, and you'll see what, what, what happened. I think we had a traction problem at one point. But anyway, um, we're, we're also doing an F-body Camaro as, a, as a long-term project on the show, Hands on Cars. It's free. It's about a 15-minute show. You're going to see Eastwood products represented, but we don't beat you up over it. It's just a fun show to watch. So, you know, uh, like us on Facebook, Hands on Cars. Get the views up. Get the numbers up so, uh, so we can keep doing this. But it's, it's a big time. And, you know, we get to come to car shows. We went to uh, Wheels in Motion and a Blast from the Past a couple of days ago. And just to, you know, just what do you guys got going on? And just go and do a walk and talk interview. It's fun stuff. Anyway, Hands on Cars is one of the cool things that we're doing at Eastwood. So let's, let's buff. With the lid closed, as we saw, it separates a little bit. <laughs> 
The reason it separates a little bit is that there are no kerosenes in this compound. It's a water-based compound. One of the reasons I like it a lot is because you don't have to get lacquer thinner on a toothbrush and scrub it out of your crevices and cracks as it gets driven down in there. Has everybody had a chance to fondle the pads? Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, trying to, I'm trying to remain PG. <laughs> What's that? Is that compared to like the pink compound or the yellow? It's all three. It's all four. You can take this and use it as a hand glaze. It's really neat stuff. It won't scratch the panel. This is a, it's a single step compound that breaks down with friction and heat. So, but it does separate because it's water based. The flip side of that, yeah, you got to shake it up a little bit and um, it makes sure it's intermixed. But it comes out as a paste and I'm going to try and not block the scene. All right. So about a quarter size or a dime size. I'm making a heck of a mess here. My pad is dry. Yeah, I want friction. It's liquid sandpaper, let's face it, but I don't know what's on this pad. So again, I'll either use straight water or this detail spray works really good. It's just a pad lube. So I give it a spritz. It just gives that little bit of pre-lubrication on the pad so you're not got a dry and dry contact, especially since we're gonna have um, revolutions. So I'll start off with a low speed, and typically this panel is gonna be flat. It's not flat, which is good because I'm not gonna sling compound all over you guys. So I'm just gonna be like this. I'm just gonna gently rub it in. And I'm 600 grit. I'm not fighting this technology. I'm not fighting the equipment. I'm floating the pad on the panel. I don't even have to look at it, and I know I'm not gonna pull an edge off. one hand and it's not jumping all over the place. The reason is it's not completely flat. I've got one edge slightly lifted and it just sort of floats over the panel. This thing's heavy. The, you know, let the equipment do the job. That's my point. Let the liquid sandpaper and the equipment do the work for you. Even on a side surface, I'm not hammering into it. Just like dry on dry is bad in the initial cut or the initial application, rubbing all of your compound off. We don't have a point and shoot thermometer here. Hey, Randy? Do we have a point and shoot thermometer? Cool, 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 cool. I'm not gonna let that get dry before my next application of compound. Some guys put the compound on the pad, some guys put it on the panel. I just get used to putting it on the panel. Six of one, half a dozen of the other. Like I said, there's more than one correct way to do this. So I've still got a haze of compound on there. And I'm 600. What was your, your speed? So we're gonna go to 14. It's, it's faster, yeah, it's more than, cool, thank you very much. So 14 is still not annoying. I, uh, it's not chattering all over the place and it's kind of getting the job done. So what I said earlier is I'll read the panel, I'll figure it out. If I want to get a little more action out of it, build a little more heat into the surface, I'll step up a little bit. Okay, so now it's dry. I'm still not done buffing, but here's what I wanted to show you. This is a point and shoot thermometer. These aren't particularly perfectly accurate. It's a really nice tool to have around. If you ever pull a trailer, shoot your tires on your fuel stops, figure out whether you're, you're you know, need to deflow, whatever. It's a good tool to have in your toolkit. We are at 90 degrees. 90.3, uh, I need a volunteer, can somebody help? What I want you to do, that spot right there, you can get, come up on the stage. Yeah, so he's got the dot on it, what does it read? 84.5. As Soon as I pull the buffer off, I want you to shoot it again. Okay. 96. We went up. 90. We went up 12 degrees in about four seconds. I saw that panel pucker. I saw a dome appear in that panel. It's warm to the touch compared to what's around it. If you drive off, yes, this is an exaggerated demo. If you drive off, your panel's already 100 degrees. Uh, you, can, you can do some damage and you can peel that paint right off of there. You can, if you pick up an edge, you can roll it right off and it's gonna break your heart. So thank you very much. What's your name? Ralph. This is Ralph. Say thanks to Ralph. <laughs> So anyway, like I said, it's, it's just a good way to read your panel. And can you, I'm kind of feeling it. Yeah. 
Hello? Hello? <laughs> Sorry, I probably ran him off. <laughs> what's that? No, I don't think it's too quick. Again, it's what's working for you. If you're jumping all over the panel, uh, slow down. You know, if you need a little more heat, that's the beauty of a variable speed buffer. You know, I was at 3,500 RPM. Yeah, yeah, that's too quick. But uh, 1,400, 1,600, it depends on what you're doing. So even though there's still 400 grit scratches in there, that just further proves my point about, about uh, finishing one step before the other. We're going to switch pads. I'm done with wool. And the next step in the liquid ice system is blue. Again, locating nub. What's that? How do you know you're done with the wool? Great question. He says, how do you know you're done with the wool? If I'm looking at the panel, and I'm looking at it from the side, and I'm reading that surface, and I can't see any more scratches, then I'm done with the wool. If it's ghosting, if it's hazy like in these edges, I'm not. I'm going to do another application of compound. And one, another thing that Juan Alejandro taught me is that when it looks like you're done, give it one more pass. On your first initial compounding stage, give it one more application of compound, one more pass. It's just insurance. Yes, sir? I've seen these small buffers for about an hour. Yeah. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. He's, he's yeah, talking about the smaller buffers. Are they, yeah, are they rotary buffers or are they orbital? Rotary. Okay. No, I, I've got a couple that are, that are rotary. I've got a little pistol grip buffer with a three inch pad, hook and loop Velcro pad. I've got one on a long handle uh, with, with a, a pad. Um, Jeff Greening from Greening Auto Company, they just picked up the Riddler Award last year for a beautiful, beautiful vehicle. It was a, a T-Bird that they, that they won with and uh, just outstanding car. Um, he has created a one inch buffing wheel. They cut and rub every surface, like the stewed pickup outside. Everything has been cut and rubbed. So sometimes you've got to make the tools. Email Eastwood if you've done something like that. Say, hey, guys, come on. You know, come up with something better than this. But he's got a one-inch pad. So again, you know, they're cutting the insides of frame rails and reliefs, and the bottom looks as good as the top. So it's, there's no end to which they'll stop to get a perfect finish, because that's what it takes, because that separates you from the Mako guy, right? So. Um, so the way you know you're done is, is read the surface and give it one more. So moving on to the blue pad, which is obviously more aggressive. And where's my detail spray? Here we are. It's a little pre-lube. Everything's better with a little lube. Yes, sir. If you're uh, on the initial cut with a little pad, yeah. when you get close to an edge, can you yeah. talk about the Absolutely. The question was, if I'm doing an initial cut on a wool pad, and this applies for everything, if you're nervous about your edges, about your style lines, and you don't want to roll that paint off, you've got fresh paint, or even if you're just flirting with an edge, uh, there's a couple of different things. I use fine line tape. Sometimes I'll use masking tape if I don't have any fine line. But let's talk about this style line here. We've got a peaked edge on this edge here. So I'm taking my fine line, tack it and stretch it, and, and there we are. So what I've done is covered that edge. I've covered that edge up. And honestly, at 1,000 RPM, 1,500 RPM, if that buffer hits that, it's going to rub it right off of there. This is a reminder. It's a reminder more than protection that I'm getting too close to that edge so I can reapply my tape. So this is a really nice idea. Um, who knows what surface tension is? Surface tension is what keeps a mosquito on the water without sinking. So surface tension applies with our with our paint jobs. Okay, surface tension. Paint kind of stretches around a corner. Here's your substrate. This is going to simulate a paint job. And I'm sorry for standing right in front of you. So we got a clear coat layer here. When it gets to this corner, it kind of stretches out. It still covers it. You've still got mill thickness there because it's still shiny. Um, but but it kind of gets stretched around that corner. Same with your peaked edges. It kind of gets stretched around where it becomes thinner just because of that surface tension pulling those other edges down. It's, it's like a, uh, kind of like a balloon. It just gets stretched over top. So the way that affects us when we're doing a rub out is it's thinner on that corner. So not only is it thinner on that corner, it's more susceptible to the pad grabbing it off. So that makes that's the best technique that I know to protect my edges. Uh, the other one, this is not a reversible buffer. To me, it's going in a clockwise motion. If I'm buffing this, 
I'm not gonna, well here, <laughs> I'm not gonna buff like that because I'm cutting into that style line. Not good. I flip my buffer and all of a sudden I'm buffing off of that style line. Same way with the edges of the hood. Just move your equipment around, change your body position. And now I'm buffing off of the panel instead of onto it. It's very simple, but sometimes we forget, sometimes we get caught up in it. If it's a tight spot, like a, like a you know, transition from the sail panel into the top of the quarter, sometimes it's hard to find that position, but it's very important to step back and just kind of figure out your equipment. This is clockwise, where does it sit in the panel? Where can I place it? Great question, thank you. Um, so, we got a little bit of surface lube on here. Now we're gonna go back, and this is the cool thing, same compound, the liquid ice, and just like polishing aluminum, the shinier it gets, the less it takes to make it even shinier than that. So now, I'm rubbing a little bit. Same drill there, I've got a little bit of haze over top of that. I'm ready for the next dollop of compound. I'm probably gonna do three applications just because. With this one, just for this demo, I'm gonna move on to the next step just to demonstrate the system. So, yeah, we're kinda of there. So we're done with the intermediate step. Then the next one, which is a much softer foam pad, the white foam, my locating nub. What's that? Yeah, liquid ice only has three, but you can go with a black waffle pad that's even finer if you need to. With this system, I haven't found it's that necessary. Sometimes on blacks, black shows everything. Black reflects everything. It absorbs every color, that's why it's black. So you gotta spend a little bit more time on scratches and halos. So I did not pre-lube. I'll put it on the pad this time. Give that a shot. That took it off relatively quickly. So let's just pretend I'm satisfied with that. I've done the whole side of the hood. It's still hazy. I don't buff it to a perfect, complete gloss because I want a little bit of lube on that panel. Then I'll take a brand new clean microfiber and anybody's detail spray really works. Spritz the pad, spritz the panel, and then I'll buff to my final gloss by hand and essentially a quarter size right in the center, we've got, a beautiful <laughs> we've got a beautiful finish. But you get the idea, it's a neat system, single compound, three pads, it gets you there and it gets you there quick. Um, buffing single stage, it's, it's about the same thing. I've found it to be more of a challenge to get the same gloss with single stage, just because it seems like the pigments in the binders, they just kind of hang on to the compound and the pad a little bit more. But a trick that I use is when I'm doing a solid color with a single stage, I'll intermix clear coat after I've got my hiding. For instance, I'll get two coats of a single stage to get my hiding. I'll intermix a compatible clear coat, mixed clear, mixed uh, single stage, blend them together. That's my third coat. Then I go 25% color, 75% clear as my fourth coat. Then I go 100% clear over all of it. It's gotta be a compatible clear, and you can't intermix, then catalyze. But you mix your batch, you mix your batch, then you intermix. What that does, you, what's the difference between reflection and refraction? Does anybody know? Exactly, that's precisely it. Refraction is how much light passes through. That's the reason that a clear coat system is more brilliant. That's why a candy makes us feel nice when we look into it. A candy is, of course, a gold or silver base coat, a true candy, a translucent mid coat, whether it be silver, blue, aqua, whatever, and then a clear coat over top of it. Here's your substrate. Let's see, there's our silver ground coat. Here's our translucent mid coat. Then there's our clear coat, which is beautiful. Your sunlight. Refraction is light like a basketball in a room. You slam it down, the light comes in, it bounces around here, comes back up here, and meets our Dave Roth flying, our Eddie, Ed Roth flying eyeball. It's the way the light bounces around in the panel and hits our eyes. And 
if it's soft and it looks like the Bermuda you know, bay on your, on your cruise that you went on, that makes us feel good. That's why we like beautiful candy jobs. Reflection is purely the light bouncing off the top of the surface and, and, and hitting our eyes back. Yes, we see a shine, but we don't see the depth. The depth is because of the refraction, and that's why there's a distinctly different look on most colors between a clear coat and a base clear, or and a single stage urethane. So um, I don't even know where I was going with that, but that's, that's, it's kind of a subliminal thing, why we like candies, why they look better to some people. So we've done this. I want to talk about el eliminating runs in the paint. Got the runs. Never fun. No one likes the runs. It's a necessary evil. It's like, it's like traction. You go up to the flirting, the, the living and breathing edge of traction with your car on the track. Once you break traction, you lose control. But you want to ride that edge. That's when you get the best performance. It's the same with painting. You got to paint and spray with your technique up until the point to where you're, you're, you're putting it on wet enough to where you're flirting with that disaster area of almost running the paint. You got to get enough on there so you got nice flow out, nice DOI, nice, uh, nice self-leveling and great gloss and enough material on there. So you're flirting with that edge. You're going to have runs. We, everybody does. You, 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 you sneeze, a bug bites your arm and you slip. You, your technique relaxes for a second and you get a paint run. What happens, we talked about surface tension too. What happens when you got a hanger on the side of a car, a gravity meter, a flow indicator, whatever you want to call it, is it bulbs out and it actually gets thinner on one or both sides of that run. So if you take sandpaper and just sand that run, your contact patch is all the way around it and technically you can, you can cut through and bust through that paint on either side of the run without having removed the run. So that's why I like surfacing from the top down, focusing on the run and essentially planing that run down until we've achieved flatness. Then I can go through my steps here and get up to gloss. So there's lots of techniques to do that. This is nothing new, nothing new under the sun. That's where the nib files come in handy and that's where the run razors come in handy. What I want to show you is a really cool technique that my dad showed me a long time ago. My dad's a paint and body guy. That's kind of how I fell into this stuff. And uh, he had this, this guy that was, uh, I think he was a prepper in one of the body shops that he worked at or managed. And, and uh, it's a single edge razor blade. Yeah, they're sharp. I keep them around. I've got drawers full of them. It's the best tool ever. Uh, and I'm not going to talk about the 80s and what we use these for on the coffee tables. We're not going to go there. But um, so we got a single edge razor blade. And technically, yes, you scrape the run out. Here's a way to get a very, very nice tool for a very little amount of money. What you're doing with your single edge blade is uh, I like to use this. Well, let's go, let's go 1500. I'm taking this on, on my tabletop, which is actually an Eastwood welding table. And this is their new plasma cutting table that ships in a box. It doesn't, it's not truck freight or anything like that. You assemble it at home and you got a beautiful plasma table with replaceable slats. So if you got a plasma cutter, you need a project area, nice piece of gear. What I'm doing with my single edge razor blade, and I'm gonna make this easy on myself because guys have asked me in the past, how do you remember which side? And you'll understand that question in a second. So I am drawing with one side on my razor blade so I understand what one, the difference between one side and the other. All right. So now, with the dark side down, like this, I'm simply dragging this razor blade over the top, like this. It's important to do this before you bend the blade, and I'll tell you why I'm bending the blade in a second. I'm just dragging it in one direction. If you've ever sharpened a knife, you'll understand what I mean with the whetstone. You go one direction. You don't saw it back and forth or you'll ruin the, the, the blade. So now what I've done, so I've created a burr going this way on the bottom of that blade. So now I know that my burr is in the opposite direction of the side that I've colored. So now my burr is pointing up. Now what I'm doing is bending it just a slight, slight bit. And what that does, when I flip it over and I put it down flat here, it takes these corners and lifts them off the panel. Now I've got a work surface that's very subtle but I'm not digging the edges in. So that's the technique there. Create the burr, bend it slightly, and now we've got an awesome tool. And it costs about four cents because they come in a box of 100. So now we've got our little rivulets of uh, tragedy right here. 
and we're just gonna, I don't know, treat it like a run. We've got heavy stuff here. We don't have a traditional run, but we got enough to, to, to show the point. Now what I'm doing, I'm dragging it very subtly. I showed this technique in the color sanding and buffing DVD, and I'm not putting hardly any pressure on it at all. And you can see what's happening. And this ties into John Sloan's question a while ago about, I'm confused. In your initial cut, I can see perfectly what's high and what's low. And what I've got there, it's just clear coat. This is this was painted yesterday, so it's pretty fresh. And of course, I'm about 30 degrees, 30 to 45, and I'm just dragging the top. It's how they used to make wooden spokes. They just plane them. The burr is facing down. Yes, because remember the black part was down. My burr is going up. I flipped it over. Put, uh, twisted my corners up, now my burr is facing down, which further refines that, that it's a really, really, really precise stainless steel blade, and I've just made it even better. Because I've corrected it with 1,000 grit, or 1,500 in this case, and, you know, and I don't even really have to be careful. I've done this a, a thousand times, but. All right, Kevin, so what happens when you shave with that? <laughs> <laughs> well, on my face, <laughs> it's, it's different. But, um, no, <laughs> no, as you can see, no, I don't get a very good close shave. The reason that I have facial hair is not vanity. When I started doing TV, they didn't know what to do with me because, let's face it, I'm a gringo. I was born and raised in Canada. I have the complexion connection. I'm as white as they come. <laughs> And I'm difficult to light in a studio environment, whatever that, you know, whatever that means. They would scratch their heads and try and, you know, they sent me to the tanning salon. I did the spray tan thing to get a little bit of color in my dermis to where we, they could light me on television. So it's like they hated to see me coming when we had, uh, a long time ago, I did a show called Classic Rides, and we did an Airstream uh, traveler, a 24-foot travel trailer, polished the whole outside of the thing. But when I'd stand in front of that trailer, it's, it's a giant egg that reflects light. So yeah, John remembers this. We, it would take them 20, 30 minutes to set up a lighting set where I walk into a scene and go, okay, I'm an idiot, we're going to put curtains on this thing, blah, 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 and then we're going to put a trailer hitch on, and then I walk out. 15 seconds took 20 minutes to light, and then I walk in, and another 45 minutes later, we can shoot the scene. So anyway, um, I'm a white guy. Mike Galley on the Horsepower TV show. He's a white guy too. We had a white off. Uh, we, we pulled our pant legs up to the knee and I won. <laughs> He's a long pants guy like me. And so anyway, whatever. I don't even know why I'm talking about this. <laughs> it's just stupid. Stupid TV stories. I told them forever. I said, we got five TV studios in one building at the Power Block. Follow us knuckleheads around with the camera crew. You will have the best reality show that you would ever have. But they won't do it. They won't listen to me. Yeah. Yes? Did you, do, did, you, did you do that same thing on, on the, the single stage too? Yes, you can do it on the single stage. And the difference is, and I haven't cleaned the surface off at all, what it does, it gives you the ability to not even, to, to, to perfect the imperfection, get it flat and level before you even start sanding. You know, if you try and sand a run out, you know, sometimes you can dig in, you can create defects like that. Yes, this works on any finish. Yeah, absolutely. This question was, can it be used on single stage? Of course it can. Yes, sir. Interesting question. He said, how long do I wait before I scrape a run before I start the buffing process? If I'm doing a show car, I'm going to cut it, I'm going to leave it for a week, two weeks. Then I'm going to come back and rub. The reason being is that what you're doing when you open up the top skin of a panel, and this really relates to this demo and to color sanding and buffing in, in a big, big way, you're, you're, it skins over. It dries from the top down. Paint cures from the bottom up, but it dries from the top down. So what that does, what does that do? You got two actions happening at once. You got a layer in here with solvents. Whether it's water, whether it's traditional solvent, you've got a layer that's trapped. Solvent is the necessary evil of a paint system. It has nothing to do with the paint system. It's a transfer vehicle. It takes the paint from your gun to the panel, then it gets out of Dodge. The success or failure of your paint job sometimes depends completely on how well you allow that evacuation of that solvent. So, what you're doing here is you're opening up the top, you're facilitating that, that solvent loss. Have, how many people have ever let clear coat dry in a cup and then looked at it? It shrinks from the sides and it shrinks. That's your solvent evacuating out of it. You know, and sometimes the solvent, if it skins over on the top, 
it, it's evil. It's bad. It'll find its way out. You, you know what solvent pop is? Solvent craters are? It's that little micro pop on the top of the panels. If it skins over too much, solvent's coming out. It, it's, it's the necessary evil of painting. The solvent is coming out. Whether it comes out on its own or whether you facilitate a nice even evacuation, that's part of the equation. So you've seen, uh, I've seen solvent craters that looks like you can put a, a stick pin into. It, it's horrible. It goes right down to the base coat and you got no protection. How many people have ever buffed a black car with a light colored compound and seen the specks in it that don't go away? Chances are that's compound getting jammed down in to these solvent craters. So cutting and rubbing, in collision work, the systems are designed to be painted on and, and buffed and evacuated to sometimes the next day, sometimes same day deliveries. But you can have a zero comeback ratio. If you're a, a, like a flat rate painter, you got one chance to do it right. Otherwise, you pay three times for it. You pay for the first time to come back, the, the car that it displaced while it was in there, and you pay a third time because now you've just displaced a third car because the, the two times that you just wasted, you could have done another car in there. You got one shot, baby. And it should really, it's just how it is. You, you know, and you get paid for that job one time. Now some shops even charge back the technicians when they make a mistake or when they got a customer comeback. So it's critical that you, you do this right the first time. You know, uh, Eastwood's slogan is do the job right. This helps you do the job right. So you're cutting the top, and I'm belaboring this for a reason. You cut the top and allow that solvent evacuation out. Let everything calm down, just like it does in your cup, on a microscopic level. It calms down, it becomes very happy. Now we can come back and cut and rub for gloss. So. Give it a transitional period. Give it a bit of time, especially if you're dealing with a, with a, like a show car like the Studebaker. You know, how long did you wait before you rubbed that thing? You let it cure, right? A week. A week, exactly. But if you let, if you let it sit a week, do you gotta rewash the car? Oh yeah, you gotta rewash it. You know, and that's the, the, the uh, glass cleaner. It's, it's a nice okay. tool, or, or rewash the car. That's a small price to pay. It's a small price to pay. And sometimes, yeah, that surface can harden a little bit more, okay. What you've done, the little extra effort that it's going to take you, a little bit extra time that it's going to take you to kind of cut through that hardness and get, get your gloss up, small price to pay. It's really going to help you. Yes, sir? What about sanding Oh, absolutely. Yeah, no, no. I do this with primer surfacers as well. And it all is because, remember this, say it with me, solvent is the necessary evil of a paint job. Solvent is the necessary evil of a paint job. It's the truest thing that I can tell you today. So yes, um, epoxy. Maybe that's an exception because you got a recoat window there that sometimes you want to take advantage of. But when I'm using high build polys or 2K urethanes, yes, sand it, let it evacuate, let it sit and cure, let it do what it's going to do. Remember that that solvent's coming out of there one way or the other. So when I block a panel, I've got a 34 Packard in my shop right now between all this media stuff. And, and, and uh, it's a beautiful old car and I'm, a, I'm privileged to have my hands on this vehicle. It's one of 30 that were ever made. It's got a hand-built Dietrich body on it. It's, it's an amazing, amazing vehicle. And I get the privilege of doing a paint job on this car. And uh, I use Eastwood's High Build Poly on it and it, because it doesn't shrink. There's almost no solvent in it and it's truly spray filler. I'm not going to say Bondo because Bondo is a brand name. I use the polys all the time. How many people use High Build Polys for, for it's a beautiful, beautiful tool. If you've never gone to a polyester surfacer, I urge you to try it. Get, it's part of the bodywork process. It's not even part of priming. It's part of the shaping process, and it's a wonderful tool. A lot of people that make different varieties of it. I particularly like Eastwood's because I'm cheap, it's inexpensive, and it has not let me down. I built a car a couple of years ago. I call it Jaded. It's a 66 Mustang Coupe. We had an interesting experiment. We went from the bare metal up, all Eastwood stuff. It was a new paint system, so I said, yeah, okay. Um, I have a theory, no bad paint, only uneducated painters. So it doesn't matter whose paint I'm using. I know I can probably get a pretty good result. So we say, yeah, let's roll the lights. Let's use the Eastwood stuff from the, from, you know, so uh, we, the car debuted at 2012 SEMA. Uh, we got shot for popular hot rodding. It was one of the, the uh, 12 best cars at SEMA and PHR. And, and I, I don't say this because I'm bragging on myself. I had the help of some wonderful friends that actually rescued my ass and got me out of trouble with our timeline that we had. The, my point is not to brag about the car, but to brag about the fact that I don't really particularly care for the uh, uh, take care of the car as well as I should. It sits in the corner of the shop. 
I'm cutting floor pans out on the Z Sled project in the Hands on Cars show. The dust is going over. It's falling on the car. I use my techniques with detailers and stuff. I took it to Mustang Week last weekend. It sat out in the open. I drove 11 hours with that car in an open car hauler. Uh, and the, the only reason I didn't drive it is because it's only got 700 miles on it and the air conditioning is not hooked up. It's summertime. I'm lazy. So anyway, I use the car. I'm not afraid of the car. That paint job has not shrunk. It has not shrunk back. There is zero scratch swelling. Uh, I did flow coats on clear, so I've got enough material on that. But I, I believe in polyester. And, and again, uh, I use the Eastwood products, and I've had great results with them. Uh, there's, there's more expensive paints. It's about technique. It's about technique. And you talk to the top of the heap guys, the greening guys, uh, you know, it's about technique and, and, and respecting the chemicals, the tools, and the solvents for what they are, allowing them to do what they do, and then you step in and do what you do better. So, um, that was a long-winded answer based on your question about letting things evacuate between coats. Uh, I can't remember which rod shop it was. He's at an Arizona rod shop, and they would, they would body work, they would get up to surfacer, and they would let the car sit a couple of months protracted timeline like crazy, but that allowed everything to leach out of it, everything to evacuate, so where they knew they could build up on it, and this was back in a time to where you'd do stupid, just crazy layers with candies and stuff like that, and th those things kind of stick with me. Um, where are we going next? So we've got this surface down, we're talking about that, we've done run razor, um, is, there, is there, uh, there any questions? By the way, what's your name? Have you, were you at Syracuse? Okay, this is Gene. That was a great question. Happy birthday. You. Okay, you bet. Um, let's see. Great question. His question was, after scraping the runs, can you just go right at it with compound, or can you, do you have to sand it? Uh, I'm just going to say, yes, you have to sand it. Because even though you've got a very finely tuned edge on your razor blade, it's still not perfect. It's not 2,000 grit. And that's kind of where I land, is 2,000 grit, then I buff for gloss. So good question. Yeah, you've got to follow through with your steps. You're correcting the surface to where you've got an even playing field for gloss, and then you bring it back up to full gloss. Um, yes, sir. I'll sand, I'll sand this flat, and then I wait a week. Okay. Yeah, sometimes you just don't have the time to wait a week. You know, if you've, if you've done your job probably, yeah, you can cheat that, but if I'm doing a restoration job that, that I want it to look as good in five years as it does the day it leaves my shop, I'm gonna, I'm gonna wait. I'm just gonna wait. And, you know, this Packard I've had in my shop in different pieces and different stages for almost a year and a half. I'm, the guy that owns the car is very patient with me. He understands that I'm doing other things and working in the shop. So we've got a great relationship like that. He just wants it done right. So it, me going to, up to Eastwood in PA for a weekend, I live in Tennessee, just south of Nashville. Uh, for me to do that, it allows that stuff to happen. So I don't even have to think about it. I just put my... Um, okay, good question. He said if it was a TV show, we wouldn't tell people. I would, well, I would tell you, the thing about TV is that you've got the luxury, you've got the, the, the ability to stop, shut the camera down, and then come back in a week. Uh, for instance, on the set of trucks, or truck tech is what it's now called, um, because the lawyers got involved. Anyway, um, we won't go there. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah, cool. So we did the, the matte black super sport stripes on there. Yeah, and we're going to talk, that's what I wanted to talk about, is matte finishes. Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> is, um, does that say, oh, God, I thought your shirt said wiener. It says member. Anyway, um, sorry. Uh, how are we doing for time, Joe? Doing great. Okay. <laughs> um, what was I talking about? I'm sorry. I went blue. Okay, yeah, matte finish on the stripes. Um, typically, we've got two projects going on at any given time. Uh, our studios are 360 degrees, which means it's technically a workshop with a bunch of TV gear in it. We can shoot in any direction, which is not typical television. The DIY shows that I did, there was a facade. It was a false set with an open ceiling and very expensive production lights in the top and, you know, a two-thirds shop at best with fake walls because the studio that I worked at, they would break the sets down between seasons. Typical season is 10 shows, maybe 12 shows. Uh, then they would 
wipe the set clean, build another set for another show, you know, and they would rotate their studio space like that because it's precious, because the lighting gear and the equipment is so, so expensive. They have to utilize that floor space over and over.